A spacecraft from another solar system invades the night sky. But this is not our sky. And we are the invaders. The search for alien life has begun. We think that other, other worlds, perhaps other Earths, if you will, exist. We know of hundreds of other planetary systems right now, and that may be the tip of the iceberg. It isn't conceivable, really, that there would not be life. Um, is it intelligent? I don't know. That's a whole other issue. Within a few decades, unmanned probes equipped with artificial intelligence may find life on planets beyond our solar system. 2014, that's the magic year. That's the magic year where the terrestrial planet finder goes up into orbit and its explicit mission is to find evidence of up to perhaps 500, 500 Earth-like planets orbiting other star systems. There is no reason not to think that on some of them, somewhere, you would find multicellular organisms like ourselves. The life we have on Earth must have spontaneously generated itself. It must therefore be possible for life to be generated spontaneously elsewhere in the universe. We now take a simulated journey, scientifically verified by leading experts, to a planet called Darwin IV. The life it supports tests the limits of technology and the intellects of the greatest minds of our generation. Because here on Darwin, life is truly full of surprises. An interstellar spacecraft named Von Braun leaves Earth orbit for a planet some six and a half light years away. Are we ready to confront the technical challenges of a mission that will take decades to complete? To find out, a team of top scientists, engineers, and artists create a virtual mission to Darwin IV, fourth planet in a binary system called Darwin. It seemed utterly important to me that the foundation to create a world was to make sure that the world was acceptable to the science community. And then we put together a team of scientists to have a look at that concept and to make sure that the laws of physics and chemistry were all represented in that model. Today, we search for planets like Earth through telescopes. The Darwin IV mission simulates the next giant step, the unmanned quest to find life beyond our solar system. The Von Braun is roughly the size of a nuclear attack submarine and travels at 37,000 miles per second, 20% the speed of light. According to Einstein, there's an ultimate speed limit in the universe. Mother Nature is like a cop, a cop that says you cannot break the light barrier. Now, the nearest star is four light years away, and Darwin, traveling at 20% the speed of light, will take 42 years to make that journey. The metal composite nose shield that protects the ship is cratered by collisions with space debris accumulated during the 42-year journey to Darwin IV. The planet orbits the larger sun of a binary solar system in a zone just close enough to its own star for comfort, a sweet spot astronomers call the Goldilocks zone not too close and not too far away, but just at the right distance that the planet can support liquid water on its surface. The Von Braun's first priority is to call home. A digital message will be sent through a laser beam, but the limits of time and space impose a roaming charge for long distance. Even at the speed of light, Von Braun's transmissions to Earth take six and a half years, making it impractical for engineers to correct problems. So Von Braun and its probes will have to think on their own. The first phase of the mission is to deploy the Darwin Reconnaissance Orbiter 
or DRO. It's going to spend months monitoring weather, looking for geology, looking for signs of life. It's going to map the entire planet, and it's going to rotate around the planet, and it's going to give us some detail on the topography. We learned a little bit about the planet via the space-based telescopes that were around our own Earth, but now that we're actually there, we're going to look down and confirm that our guesses were correct. So that when we put these probes down, which can only explore a small fraction of the planet, we get the most out of it. Images surge through the DRO's camera lens. Infrared, radar, and visible light pictures reveal an equatorial mountain range and vast plains swirling with weather systems. Darwin 4 has no oceans, just a small blue sea. Von Braun's computers sift through thousands of destinations before selecting the one landing site with the most to offer. The Von Braun launches a probe about the size of a dump truck named Balboa, after the famous explorer. Balboa enters Darwin's airspace as our first ambassador to a pristine alien planet. of the Darwin mission have prepared for just such a scenario. The Von Braun vehicle carries two additional probes. Probe Leonardo da Vinci is nicknamed Leo. followed by a twin probe, the eyes of Newton, a.k.a. Ike. The probes enter the atmosphere just like the space shuttles do on Earth. The final approach is a lazy S pattern to burn off excess speed before landing. surface, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Leo is first to land and emerge from his vehicle. Leo's bird-like head is crammed with sensors. Driven by protocols embedded in his software, Leo confirms that Ike's landing is on track and sends a status report to the Von Braun. The news that Leo and Ike have landed is beamed to Earth. Perhaps it's fitting that scientists who were babies when the Von Braun left Earth now announce the birth of interstellar space travel. Watching these probes from back on Earth would be much like sitting in the back of an auditorium watching your child at a spelling bee where you know the answer and you're sitting there hoping that they're going to make the right decision and come forth with the right answer, but also knowing that you can't do a thing to help them at this moment. Darwin 4 has a denser atmosphere than the Earth's, and the probes would have been designed to cope with that. Now, we would have known that the atmosphere was, in fact, denser before we got there. The way we would have known that is by looking at the spectrum of this planet and looking at the signature from oxygen in the planet. That oxygen signature would have been so broad, we would have known there was much more oxygen there in that atmosphere than we have on Earth. Well, today, our awareness of the universe has expanded 
you know, exponentially, really. We've gotten smart. We've learned. We've done our homework. The first wave of space telescopes showed us one thing. Earth-based tel telescopes showed us another. Physics, computers, mathematics has come together in a beautiful confluence that has allowed us to recognize what before was unmeasurable. Recently, some astronomers have said, bah, humbug. The conditions for life are extremely rare. For example, you need a large moon to stabilize the orbit of the Earth, or else the Earth tumbles in its orbit. You need a large Jupiter to clean out the comets and meteors of the solar system. You have to have so many Goldilocks zones. The Earth has to be just right for this, just right for that, that perhaps we are alone. Well, I don't think so. Because if you look at the number of stars in the heavens, perhaps 10 billion trillion stars that are within the range of our telescopes. And you realize that half of them, perhaps half of them have solar systems around them. And if you play the odds, you come up with the realization that perhaps there are billions, billions of planets in our universe that have conditions that are compatible with life as we know it. Leo's first assignment is to recon a region studded by tall, mysterious, gourd-like structures. Before he can take them on, he's got to get himself together. Darwin-4's atmosphere is drenched in water vapor, a free source of hydrogen, which Leo converts to inflate a large bag on his back. It's covered with photosynthetic solar panels. The array turns a green hue as an algae-like material within the cells generates energy from Darwin-4's two suns. like head contains two sensitive camera eyes. His arms are simulated plastic muscle, tipped with sensors and a manipulator that can pluck a petal off an alien daisy. Thrusters on pivots push him along at a top speed of 30 miles an hour. Leo senses movement in his side-scanning radar. investigate the source of the movement. His artificial intelligence isn't programmed for it at this point. Leo's first priority is finding his yellow-tailed brother. While physically identical, Ike and Leo were created with complementary personalities. Ike is safety conscious. Leo is inquisitive and programmed to take risks. Their artificial IQs are roughly those of four-year-old children. Their missions can be redirected by the Von Braun supercomputers at any time. Assisting them are mini probes, like this spider. It's designed to explore places too tight or dangerous for Leo and Ike. The data they collect is transmitted to the Von Braun for analysis. Camera discs serve as high-speed scouts. saucers can be retrieved and recharged. Radical changes in Darwin 4's weather could tear the probes to shreds. So Ike and Leo deploy an early warning system. Small weather balloons monitor the atmosphere. It's now time for the last diagnostic check. Should Ike or Leo confront intelligent life, they'll present a calling card in the form of a hologram. Number comprehension, 
Images of our galaxy, solar system, the Earth, and the human species are offered as an interstellar handshake. Leo has sensed something again. Von Braun determines that Leo and Ike are fully prepared to explore the bizarre structures that surround them. Scientists will name them gourd trees. Fifteen stories high, they stand on a matrix of root-like stilts. Von Braun's computers determine the stilts could only support such a huge mass if the gourds were hollow or filled with some type of spongy material. But Leo and Ike are not programmed to immediately study objects like the gourd trees. Some astrobiologists predict the only alien life forms we may stumble upon are microorganisms, and the probes are designed to study them. Leo is programmed to search for them in the first puddle of water he finds. A microcosmos of single and multiple cell life forms fill his sensors. But Leo is about to discover that life on Darwin 4 comes in many sizes and many faces. This life form is roughly the size of a T-Rex. But instead of a roar, it directs a single wave of sonar at Leo and Ike. Darwin 4 has dealt the mission a wild card. The probes are in the middle of an extraterrestrial Serengeti, and it's a whole new game. The discovery that Darwin 4 is not just a planet capable of sustaining life or had life at a simple level on it, in fact, had an entire complex interactive multicellular uh, biosphere comparable to what we see on Earth is one of the greatest discoveries, the greatest discovery in the history of mankind. We can almost be certain that life that we find on another planet will have evolved along lines differently from the life on Earth. The arrow tongue is a, a remarkable large predator. As far as, as we can tell, in terms of the land living predators on Darwin 4, it's the largest one we got a record of. So when we look at Darwin 4 and look at an organism like an arrow tongue, and then we look at Earth and an organism like a Tyrannosaurus rex, we've got two different evolutionary pathways, starting out with different raw materials under perhaps similar circumstances, and we end up with these two organisms that in some ways are very, very similar, and in other ways are extremely different. We really need to examine the entire food chain on this planet, from the very smallest animals up to the largest, to get a sense of what is what does Earth and Darwin 4 have in common? When we left Earth, we would not know anything really about Darwin 4. We would know some very broad things, but we wouldn't know if the surface was covered with water. We wouldn't know if the surface was very marshy or very strange. And if you send a probe that can just fly over everything and fly very slowly, which a lighter than air probe can do, then you can cover all the bases pretty well. The intelligence of Ike and Leo is very much like a small child. Uh, intellectually, the child might know to do certain things and not to do others, but in some cases uh, may need to be reinforced. A child doesn't know necessarily not to touch the burner of a stove, and Ike and Leo may not be aware of all the possible threats in its environment and would have to learn from those. If we realize that there's other life at a higher order, of multicellular organization, of, of even, you know, adaptation to environment, I think that would rock profoundly our boat. And, you know, in one sense, it may, it may actually lead to a, a greater realization that we have to do more exploring because our own little backyard is not as um, isolated and protected as we think it is. And I think it will lead to amazing opportunities. By learning about that other life, we may better recognize our own limits, our own possibilities.
Earth's eyesight may be less evolved than large life on Earth. So using sonar could be a more accurate means of locating objects around it, like Leo and Ike. Splotches of bioluminescence cover the creature's back. Astrobiologists could call this creature the arrow tongue. The arrow tongue determines the probes pose no threat and turns its attentions elsewhere. The gyro sprinter is a two-legged vegetarian about twice the size of an African antelope. Arrow tongue reveals itself as an ambush predator, capable of great bursts of speed. As predator and prey hit speeds of 40 miles per hour, the probes are left in the dust. Ike launches a camera disc to follow the action. The arrow tongue commands the road like a semi-truck. The gyro sprinter corners on a dime. Night falls on Darwin 4. Scattered bands of bioluminescence rake the surface like some kind of alien landscape lighting. Possibly it's a form of communication on Darwin 4. But Ike and Leo ignore the light show and push on towards their prime objective. Their first priority is to scour the landing site for Balboa, the lost probe, to confirm its fate. The Darwin mission now depends on just two intrepid probes with the intelligence of preschoolers. Images of the Balboa and of large life forms taken by Ike and Leo are evaluated by the Von Braun. Its supercomputers now make important adjustments in the programming of the two probes. The probes are directed to split up. Leo will hunt for Darwin's larger creatures, while Ike explores ecosystems and life forms that resemble plants. As Leo's quest begins, he flies over a geothermal vent. Here, he'll top off his gas bag with some hydrogen from the mist. But even during a pit stop, a good probe keeps exploring. Life on Darwin 4 never stops either. In the midst of this volcanic cauldron, Leo finds microorganisms that resemble some found in hot springs on Earth. His twin probe, Ike, explores a small, isolated forest. The floor is covered with stickball plants, part sponge, part virus. molds called Darwin tomatoes rise from the dense soil. Then Ike's sensors suddenly direct him skyward. Called trunks 
suckers. They cling to these plaque bark trees, sucking nourishment from the nutrient-rich layers just beneath the tough outer shingles. It's here that the mission reaches another milestone. After seeing life everywhere, Ike gets his first glimpse of death on Darwin IV. But death from what? Tongue is a very, again, interesting organism. It has a lot of similarities to some of our dinosaurs. It doesn't have the maneuverability uh, uh, of some of its prey items. A formidable high-speed predator. It's an ambush predator. It appears to sneak up on its on its prey and, and then take them down quickly. Very high efficiency predator, very highly evolved, very interesting animal. Gyro sprinter is a very improbable animal when we look at animals on Earth. But this is an animal that needed to get away from predators was running in a loping manner, beat things out 100 million years earlier. Its predator got faster, it got faster. And Tavilla developed this amazing sense of balance, the large feet for gripping and uh, handling on the turf. Looking at the shoulder girdle and the, the hip girdle, it appears that this animal may have evolved from a four-legged animal. It appears we have a fusion here of the forelimbs, a fusion of the hind limbs. Truly extraordinary, something we would never predict from life on Earth. One of the things about the plants on Darwin IV is that superficially they seem kind of bizarre. And yet when we look at plants on Earth, we find that there's a lot of really bizarre plants on Earth too. It's just that they're not common. One of the things that we might ask about a plaque bark tree is, first of all, is it transporting nutrients and water? And we're guessing that it is, but we might also ask, where does it transport them? And we didn't tell the probes to go checking. But we can learn about this from looking at the behaviors of the trunk suckers. They're very similar to some sorts of birds, woodpeckers that we have here on Earth. They fly, they land on the trunk of a tree, they prop themselves up with their tail, and they're taking fluid from the, from the tree. This tells us some things about the trunk suckers, where they're getting their energy, but it also is informative about the plants and what they're doing. So trunk suckers are informative about both plants and animals. If you look at the diversity of what species look like on this planet, uh, uh, nature has come up with better things than our best uh, science fiction uh, artists and, and people try to conceive what a foreign species would look like. Uh, some of these uh, things that come out of the deep ocean uh, just are, are absolutely amazing creatures. Just the diversity from the same starting materials of DNA and genes by mixing and matching these, almost any physical appearance is possible. For the past three days, the Darwin Reconnaissance Orbiters tracked a large object moving rapidly across the surface. Leo has been ordered to investigate what mission scientists call an object of interest. out, the object of interest is not an object at all. It's a bunch of them. Leo locks onto a herd of creatures called unks. and lungs, but they also inflate secondary air sacs on both sides of their bodies. Onths are named after the sound they make when they exhale through their dorsal vents. Thank <laughs> you. 
like buffaloes on Earth, the unts are competitive, possibly fighting for domination of the herd. Something spooks the herd. Leo senses movement nearby, but can't get a fix. His sensors are simultaneously scanning in all directions, looking for the strongest signal. The newest input comes through Leo's microphones. A pair of bladder horns compete. Bioluminescent antlers are displayed to scare off opponents. The racket from this jewel might have spooked the unts. the back and forth bellowing as a form of communication. Perhaps this alien grump is smarter than it looks. Leo deploys the Earth communication screen. Like a greeting card, it's the best hello we can offer. But if the Blatterhorn is saying anything, it's probably telling Leo to get lost. The Blatterhorn cuts and runs as Leo's sensors detect another disturbance. For the next 24 hours, the Von Braun makes several attempts to communicate with Leo, but gets no reply. A grim dispatch rides a laser beam to Earth. Probe Da Vinci has gone offline. Cause unknown. Ike and Leo's programming would be different uh, so that they would respond differently. You have a chance of one of them responding in a situation that may not be the best response to that situation, may put the probe in danger. By having the two probes carry separate software, you have a chance to have one survive where another one might fail. The UNTS are interesting in that they occur in, in herds or, or groups. Uh, this is one of the Darwin IV animals that we see where there is the evolution of sociality, social groups, which is also very important and evolved evidently many times on Earth. These animals are interacting with each other in a number of sophisticated ways, probably both to establish pecking order within the, uh, the herd, and even though we're not sure uh, what's a female and what's a male in the uns at this point, certainly the kind of interactions we're seeing with these animals are very similar to males fighting for females that we see on Earth among herding animals. The bladder horn is a very interesting animal for a variety of reasons. One thing that's a bit unexpected is that the bladder horn is the only animal we've seen so far that in fact appears to use sound as a major means of communication. It's taking some of the features we would expect to see, that is, display features that would be used in competition. We see these animals interacting front to front, probably these, these uh, horns with the bladders are fundamental in the way they interact with each other. When we do make contact with an intelligent life form, they may be descended from predators. Take a look at our animal kingdom. We have foxes, lions, and tigers with stereo eyes to the front, and then we have rabbits and deers with eyes to the side. That's because the predators have to zero in on the prey. They, are, they have cunning, they have stealth, they know how to ambush. Well, if you're a rabbit, all you have to do is know how to run. So which is more intelligent, the fox or the rabbit? Well, obviously, the fox is more intelligent than the rabbit. So chances are, when we meet intelligent life forms in outer space, they're going to be descended from predators. Unless he resumes transmitting again, 
Leo is virtually an invisible dot on a vast alien landscape. Leo's twin probe, Ike, soldiers on. He finds another pocket forest, the living remains of woodlands that thrived until Darwin's oceans evaporated and the climate changed. Ike begins to scan the trees, his sensors pick up something new, lurking on a high branch of a plaque bark tree. Scientists will call it the dagger wrist for good reason. When Ike launches a camera disc, the dagger risk is not interested in posing. The dagger wrist's forelimbs sink so deep, the nutrient rich sap bleeds to the surface. Ike's not programmed to approach something this aggressive. That was Leo's job. The study of plant life is Ike's mission, until von Braun orders otherwise. Finding water is statistically the most efficient method of finding vegetation. Ike scans a carpet of moss at the edge of a deep water marsh. But what lies beyond it is even more intriguing. Ike surveys three odd mounds covered with saplings. But appearances are deceiving on Darwin IV. alive for long periods of time. They're not hibernating. They're feeding. Grovebacks absorb nutrients from the soil through the skin of their underbodies. When the ground's depleted, they move on in search of new feeding areas. Groves of trees sprout from these immense creatures. The grove pack provides them water from its spongy tissue. The trees inject sugars into the grove pack. Just enough juice to jumpstart these titanic walkabouts on Darwin IV. A burst of data kicks von Braun's computers into hyperdrive. Mike's brother, Leo, has come back online. If Iker Leo were to come back 
uh, after having gone offline, the first thing you'd want to know is why. They'd need to send you some information, what caused the reboot, anything they could tell you, as well as, if possible, have saved some data from just before the problem so that you'd be able to see what was going on when the problem occurred, and then their response to it so that you could start trying to figure out what had happened. The grove back is the most massive animal that we have a record of on Darwin Boar. Uh, it's tremendous size, uh, supports the, my own theory that I put together on these animals and I think shared by some other scientists. They have a much lower body density. The size of our grove back far exceeds the, the mass of any of our dinosaurs that we have records of living on Earth. My first impression on the dagger wrist is that this is a very large praying mantis. Uh, it has a limb configuration that is reminiscent of the four limbs of a praying mantis, although the dagger wrist uses them to climb trees, which was very interesting. Moving by gliding is very interesting. This is a rather large animal. The membranes involved in producing the lift, the gliding appear rather small. We have to remember that the gravity on Darwin IV is, is less than, than Earth, and we also have to remember we're gliding through a thicker atmosphere, so the dynamics are going to be different. People ask me all the time, you know, why should we care about discovering new things if it isn't applicable to us? If it doesn't put food on the table or gas in the car, why should we care? And all I can, all I can say is that, you know, if you're not curious enough to want to know the answer to anything you can know, anything we can discover, then you're not, you're not human. Next, Ike solves a gruesome mystery in the forest, and the wide wings of aerial hunters cast their shadows across Darwin IV. The Von Braun has picked up a signal from the lost probe, Leo. Ike is sent on a mission to find his twin, but his search has barely begun when Ike encounters a pair of Darwin IV's greatest predators on this alien planet. I think statistics would say life is a cosmic imperative. I personally believe from all the observations that NASA has offered humanity for the last 50 years suggests that the environments could be there. We now recognize potential habitats on Mars today that you could insert Earth life into and have it potentially be sustained. This is amazing. 25 years ago, we might not have said that. And then the question is, why don't we see it all around us? And I, I think that begs the bigger question, do we really know what we see all around us? We are just taking those baby steps into that cosmic ocean with a few elegant robots and a few human voyages. We've barely left the cradle. As Von Braun tries to get a fix on Leo, his twin probe, Ike, moves deeper into the foothills of Darwin IV. of pine on Earth, the pocket forests of Darwin IV are covered with colonies of passive organisms that feed on the moist, spongy floor. As Ike continues to explore, the Darwin Reconnaissance Orbiter detects a sudden atmospheric disturbance. While Ike's sensors clock the wind at only 30 miles per hour, the super-dense atmosphere gives it the kinetic punch of a young hurricane. Ike has no choice but to head for the ceiling to get out of the storm. Ike fires a salvo of weather balloons to sample the currents of the unexplored upper atmosphere. Unlike the Earth, where storms are fed by great oceans, Darwin IV's airspace is a shifting maze of thermals rising from hot spots created by the two suns. The power of passing storms present a new and potentially lethal threat to the mission. Ike is little more than a fragile sack of hydrogen on a planet where even the weather seems predatory. Now, it's back to the business of discovery.
Lake's motion sensors pick up activity within the grove. Not on the ground, but in the air. The link between a deadly hunter, its prey, and the plaque bark tree suddenly unfolds. The dark king of the pocket forest fills in the missing pieces of a predatory puzzle. Trunk suckers feed on the sap from gashes made by climbing dagger wrists. Ike's data confirms that dagger wrists extract the pre-digested material from the corpses of their prey. A gruesome but energy-efficient survival strategy on Darwin 4. The weather on Darwin 4 is puzzling. 130 days have passed since Ike began his survey, and never once has it rained. As far as Ike's sensors can determine, Darwin's surface waters flow from underground aquifers and springs. That might explain why forests can only exist in small pockets. Ike takes his survey to a high meadow where his side-scanning radar detects some new blips. A sonar ping throws a herd of littoral lopes into a pack. Like the arrow tongue, these aerial killers hunt with sonar. No creature on Darwin 4 is safe from the lance of the flying skewer. is hollow and as strong as titanium. Running through its center is a razor-spiked tongue that bores through the toughest hide. Helpless prey are killed and drained of fluids. Scavengers, called jet darters, feed on the rest. that they're not using their, their wings or aerofoils in, in order to fly. They seem to be jet propulsed. Using the skewer to impact a prey item and then lift it is highly unexpected. The, the forces involved there are tremendous. Um, in a flying animal, if you suddenly attach all that weight on the front, that shifts the center of balance of the animal, which is very critical for flying, which is almost certainly why they almost go straight up after they impale a, a prey item because the center of gravity with the center of weight for the animal shifted so far forward. Dropping of the prey item and having another one swoop it and catch it in the air is again very unusual. Uh, kind of reminded me of what we see when we throw uh, large hunks of fish up to frigate birds when you're out fishing the way they fight and interact for it. We'd want to know is there competition here or is this cooperative behavior? Are these related individuals? Um, all sorts of interesting questions about skewers. One piece of evidence that suggests the probability of primitive forms of life appearing, may be reasonably high, is that life seems to have appeared on Earth, shortly after the Earth cooled sufficiently for life to be possible. If life was very unlikely, 
One might have expected life not to have appeared until late in the 10 billion years or so that the Earth has to live. On Darwin 4, the mission encounters giant life forms and supersized animal organisms, all supported by a dense, humid atmosphere and a lower gravity than on Earth. skies are falcon-like predators called skewers. Aerial life forms that travel and hunt in pairs. Skewers maneuver by changing the shape of their 50-foot wingspans. But it's not their wings that actually propel them. Skewers create methane gas internally and combust it in four jet-like pods. defend themselves by scattering in all directions. Skewers are forced to choose only one target. Darwin's aerial predator is literally knocked from the sky. But by what? Above the foothills of Darwin's equatorial mountain chain, Ike's sensors detect unusual bursts of energy. A swarm of scavengers called jet darters stray into a kill zone. like a colony of oversized mushrooms is a deadly maze. Mike's program to gather more data to learn how it works. The answer must lie within the organisms themselves. But Ike can't risk frying his circuit boards. A mini probe is the only expendable option. The crawler will look for the power source from below. Like a light switch, the crawler has closed a fatal gap between two electric charges. Like sensors pick up a familiar signature. Just walking on Darwin 4 is a hazardous undertaking. Even a five-story grove back must watch its step. A colony of beach quills launch an assault on a careless grove back. penetrate deep into the creature's hide and deliver a fatal dose of neurotoxins. The beach quills consume the grove back alive. Far from the killing field, another struggle continues in a remote corner of Darwin 4. Leo has no fix on his location. To find his position, he must launch a camera disc to clue in to his surroundings. Leo 
Bell's last transmission allows von Braun's supercomputers to plot his location. Ike is roughly 200 miles away from Leo as he continues his survey of the foothills. Badlands encrusted with ancient lava fields are covered with lichens and low vegetation. Like sensors now lock on to higher life forms. Like alien ghosts, they seem to come from everywhere. But these nimble creatures all follow the same scent. On Earth, we have wolves. On Darwin 4, they're called prong heads. One can look at the electrified plants. Here's this thing that looks like a plant, and yet it's zapping things out of the sky. And you sort of wonder, what is it doing with the things that it zaps? Is it simply frightening them off? Is it killing them and eventually eating them, and we're not seeing that? And so it gets back to the question of, is this a plant or is this an animal? But the plant and animal distinction is one that's very peculiar to the way that humans look at life because we live on the surface of Earth, and as it turns out, at this stage in the Earth's history, there's only two big lineages of living organisms in the land. The plants, they're green, they're photosynthetic. The animals, they run around, they eat things. And so we see that as a very important distinction. It shouldn't be a surprise to us at all to find an organism on Darwin IV or any place else that combines aspects of what we might think are plant and animal. Now, if we look at Darwin IV, we're gonna look for evidence of both how these animals developed locomotive pathways, how they developed efficiency at locomotion, uh, predator-prey interactions. If we look at the attack of the beach quills on the growth back, we come to the conclusion very quickly that this animal uh, must have been subjected to a very toxic poison, perhaps similar to that produced by cone shells on Earth today, which is one of the most potent toxins we know of, where a cone shell can very quickly kill a large fish and then consume it. One of the things we would want to know if that was going on is to go back and look at one of these places after the beach quills have killed the grove back to see what's happened next. Are they turning into the next stage of their life? So there's a lot we want to know to be able to sort out all these possibilities. Life forms, uh, when we go to another planet and looking for life forms, I think the first thing we need to do is have a definition of what a life form is. Uh, we certainly have a definition, or we have a number of definitions of what people would like to think life forms are based on Earth, uh, based on what we have here on Earth. There may be life forms uh, composed of many other uh, uh, molecules that, that don't exist here on Earth, but, but before we can actually call something a life form, we have to have a definition of what it is. Sprinters are fast and evasive creatures. But prong heads know how to run interception. predators on Earth, not every hunt ends in success. But the discovery of cooperative hunting is a major breakthrough. The inhabitants of Darwin IV are more evolved than anticipated. Artificial intelligence computers on the Von Braun have decided to do something about Leo. As a result, the protocols that control Ike's behavior are reprioritized. Ike is ordered to break off his survey immediately. 
He's now instructed to assume greater risks. His mission now is to find Leo. The journey will take him across a vast, unexplored region of Darwin IV. Based on data from the reconnaissance orbiter, Darwin's oceans evaporated millions of years ago, transforming the air into a dense, oxygen-rich blanket. When the oceans vanished, they left behind a badland of twisted spires. Over the eons, some have grown a mile high. The spires are the accumulated remains of billions of tons of ocean salts and minerals. identifies a new object of interest, like nothing yet seen on Darwin IV. The curved formations don't mesh with the environment. Perhaps they were made by some creature yet to be discovered. its oceans, it still maintains a sea roughly the size of Texas. But what looked like water from space doesn't hold up under closer examination. The water's edge looks like a thick sheet of gelatin surrounded by great spires of salt. Ike can't penetrate the surface. It's like a waterbed teeming with life. like a sea is actually a vast colony, a matrix of symbiotic life forms. They evolved as the oceans evaporated, trapping seawater within their transparent membranes. The Van Braun has calculated that crossing the amoebic sea is the quickest way to reach the site of Leo's last transmission. Halfway there, Ike spots a radical change in the surface texture. like a gigantic predator that preys on low-flying game. The Darwin Reconnaissance Orbiter issues a sudden storm alert. A wall of debris is closing in at high speed. Ike's one chance to survive may already be out of reach. What you see 
around the Amoebic Sea are salt sand dunes, which are the remnants of the ocean that once covered Darwin IV. As that ocean receded, what happened was extremely ingenious. The life in that ocean developed its own seal to protect the loss of the last piece of the ocean. And that life-covered remnant of the ocean is what is the Amoebic Sea. Darwin IV is a planet that doesn't have a lot of water. Whereas here on the Earth, we have a lot of water vapor available to drive storms. And the water has a special property of being able to store and release energy. So that's how we drive the storms on the Earth. On Darwin IV, though, with little water, you end up instead with storms being driven by temperature differences. So those incredible storms we see over the Amoebic Sea are driven by differences in temperature that occur between differences in absorption of sunlight between the salt dunes and the darkness of the sea. The behavior we see with the prong heads is very reminiscent of what we see with a wolf pack, in that you have animals uh, flanking out in different areas, uh, going very slow, and then certainly kind of corralling uh, the prey into one spot where they can finish it off. It is very suggestive of a coordinated hunting strategy. In terms of pack hunting, there needs to be greater intelligence to coordinate uh, a pack hunting behavior such as we see in uh, wolves or we predict might have happened among uh, the dromaeosaurs or raptor dinosaurs. You have to have a fairly large uh, brain capacity. However, these are still instinctive behaviors in these organisms. After all is said and done, I would hope that when we discover life in outer space, what we take with us is the fact that life is precious. Life is so precious. It took billions of years of a complex series of accidents, accidents to create life on the planet Earth. We have great oceans, liquid water oceans, perhaps the most precious substance in the universe, liquid water, and what do we do with it? We pollute it. We dump all our garbage in the liquid oceans. So I would hope that we come away with our understanding, realizing how precious it is that we exist, how precious it is that life can form and grow, and that we have to protect it. A perfect storm strikes Darwin IV, and Ike meets the awesome monarchs of the Amoebic Sea. Next. The largest denizens of Darwin IV guide Ike from danger on the alien planet. Single cell life is the key event in evolution, in my view. Uh, there certainly wouldn't be any uh, macro life on Darwin or any other planet if it didn't start with single cell life. So if we didn't start with microorganisms, single cells that eventually worked in colonies and then worked out to form networks, eventually multicellular organisms, there would be no larger uh, life that would be visible to the eye. There's a commonality of life that we build from these same building blocks but we put great emphasis because of our visual acuity on how things look and if they look different or not. We put much more significance on that than if they have radically different metabolism. Isaac Newton is blasted by a cyclone of salt and caustic minerals. Ike could have run from the storm by rising above. His new directive is to assume greater risk in the search for Leo. Crossing the Amoebic Sea is the shortest path. Ike's sensors detect a huge disturbance. But it's not the storm.
The Sea Strider is seven stories tall. seem to orbit the Strider, attracted to an energy source just beneath its mouthless head. The Striders are not just walking on the surface, they're taking chunks of it along with them. The storm ends as suddenly as it began. The Striders are heading the same direction Ike must take to reach Leo. So Ike will tag along and gather data on the alien giants. Astrobiologists could find that the Striders eat from mouths at the bottom of their giant feet. Trudging back and forth across the sea on a movable feast. Things disturb the Striders, but quickly vanishes from Ike's sensors. The Flyers are nymph-like young of the Sea Striders. relationship to the sea as well. The far shore is finally in sight. Here, the peaceful giants of Darwin IV make a U-turn. Based on Leo's transmissions to the Von Braun, Ike will follow his trail like a robotic bloodhound. Within hours, Ike nears one of Leo's last reported locations. The Unth herd hasn't strayed far from where Leo first encountered them. An adult makes ruts in the ground. Perhaps the patterns found by the spires were created by a herd like this one. Ike spots a metallic glint that could only come from Leo. The sea strider's immense size and extreme height suggests that these animals are less dense than the animals we're familiar with on Earth. To carry such an immense weight around on two legs, immense volume, we can't justify that with the same kind of densities that we see in animals on Earth. It's just mechanically impossible. One of the other things that's kind of surprising, we're seeing these in a storm, they're very large organisms. How do they keep from being blown over, especially if they're light enough that they don't sink to the bottom of the sea? So there's a lot of things about the sea strider we'd like
like to know more about? The science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke said that there either is or is not intelligent life in outer space. However, either thought is frightening. However, I tend to look at it as exhilarating. I tend to believe that when we make contact with another intelligent life form, we will perhaps have a tremendous bonanza of scientific information, so much cultural exchange that will be involved. As a scientist, I look forward to the day when we make contact with other intelligent life forms in the universe. So rather than being frightened, I think we'd approach the idea with open arms, with open mind, realizing that this could be a turning point in the history of the human race. Our first forays beyond the solar system to the nearest nearby planets will be robotic. They ought to be robotic. It makes sense. And we will be the bystanders, much more so than we are today with our robotic emissaries. But that's okay, because it's my belief that as we do that, we will have trained ourselves for those smart machines to act more like us. Not to be us, they never will. But they'll act more like us in the sense that they'll observe, mine the data, understand the, the anomalies, the, the, exciting, the excitement, find the sweet spots and tell us that at the limits of the speed of physics, the speed of light. And as they go, they'll open the doors in our eyes to how we may go. It's not the camera disc that stumps Ike's computer. It's what lays around it. Ike is unable to determine if something actually built this site. Ike detects motion as he heads for Leo's final transmission point. The bladder horn still defends the same piece of turf. But Leo's nowhere in sight. No place to run and no time to hide from Darwin's deadliest predator. The probe is not equipped to evade predators like the skewer. But that's not a problem now. Like sensors pick up a new life form. And he follows the signal. at the base of a steep mountain face. Or does it? Whatever killed the skewer has managed to lift all 50 feet of it up a sheer cliff. senses no movement, 
No transmissions coming from his twin probe, Leo. itself on another planet uh, would would be the most breathtaking uh, emotional uh, charge that a scientist could ever possibly have. Life on Earth could have turned out very, very different except for specific events that were sort of random in nature, probably the best known of which was the asteroid that hit the Earth at the end of the Cretaceous period caused the extinction of all the large dinosaurs. Without that single event, the organisms that survived to the present day would have been very, very different from the ones that we see. And so to the extent that in a planet like Darwin IV, we find things that resemble organisms on Earth, that's astonishing to us because it tells us that there's something more than the luck of the draw. There's some reason they look that way, they just didn't turn out that way. I think just knowing we're not alone, at the, even at the cellular level, will change our view of our own, our own neighborhood and on beyond the universe. But then the question will be, well, how are we related to that? Are we all the same stuff? I mean, Sagan said so well, we're all made of star stuff, and we are. Ike is about to make contact with humanity's greatest discovery. Next. On the alien planet, Ike attempts to communicate with life forms that seem intelligent. The octopus has eyes, very weak eyes. It has tentacles by which it can manipulate the environment, but it has no culture. It cannot transmit information from generation to generation. But if you could breed the octopus for millions of years, perhaps you could breed octopus with the capability of speech, the capability of handing down information, and perhaps even a race, another race of intelligent beings on the planet Earth. So the bottom line is, why should an alien life form look just like us? have easily destroyed the probe. Instead, it waits for Ike to make the next move. When Ike projects numeric symbols, the alien seems ready to respond. is a test to determine if this alien creature can conceptualize and is therefore intelligent. Ike flashes three symbols. The alien responds correctly with four flashes. This response triggers Ike to deliver the rest of the message. closes in, 
Ike launches a camera disc to assess the threat. days into the Darwin IV mission, the last recorded image of Ike and Leo is sent to the Von Braun. Computers play and replay the data for the next 72 hours. But interpretation of this profound event is beyond the scope of its artificial intelligence software. To evaluate the full significance of our first extraterrestrial contact requires human intelligence. After decades of research, the pieces begin to fall together. Scientists call the creatures Eosapiens, life forms with intelligence possibly similar to that of early man. Eosapiens appear to be highly mobile and airborne. They navigate with organic thrusters and a large, delicate bag of methane for lift. The Eosapiens may see the camera disc launched by the probes as threats. This misunderstanding may have triggered the destruction of Leo. As the simulated mission to this alien planet ends, the questions it raises are as immense as the universe. Will we ever find life beyond our planet? What must we do to reach it? And how can we prepare ourselves psychologically to deal with the discovery of alien life forms? Finding life beyond Earth, it really is just going to be a matter of uh, persistence. Um, we'll probably have to send a lot of probes. I mean, we're just beginning. You know, the, the, the world and the universe is about to open up to you. You know, we're just slowly waking up out of our cave, for God's sakes. This is the best time. In the next, you know, two or three hundred thousand years will be fantastic. It's great to be alive. I think discovering life on another planet might be one of the most fantastic things uh, for humans. If we want to find advanced intelligent life, our best bet is to listen for radio signals, like the SETI project. Interstellar distances are too large for us to travel to more than the closest stars. If we want to explore the galaxy, so we'd better send robots, but we may not live long enough to hear back from them. We find life on another planet. We're going to, first of all, know that we're not the center of the universe anymore. I think it's important that we understand our place in the universe. I, I think it's terribly important that in so doing, we come full circle to respect the world that we're on and to understand the distances and what the universe is all about. We will know that if the conditions for life are present, then life can arise at multiple sites in the universe, and that we now live in a living universe that we're ready to explore. I think the revolution that science is giving us as we look at our solar system in the accessible universe will continue to unfold. When we get the next generation telescopes up there, we will not only see indirect evidence of other Earths, but we'll see the earlier time of the universe and have better abilities to understand how the universe, the galaxies that, that populated came to be. You have seen nothing yet because it's only gonna get better. And that zone, that gap between science fiction and science fact is just gonna come together. And, you know, I've never met a science fact that couldn't be seen as interesting as some of the best of science fiction. And I think we're gonna see that zone blurring together as we continue the quest for life. Thomas Huxley, the great biologist in the last century, said that perhaps one of the noblest achievements of science and philosophy is to discover our true role in the universe. Who are we? Where do we fit in the larger scheme of things? That, he thought, was the central question unifying philosophy, science, and art. And today, 
I think we may be able to answer that question because we are on the verge of perhaps the greatest breakthrough in the history of science, and that is the discovery of other life forms in space.